All right, let's get started. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have Professor Wenping Wang from Tamu give a talk in our 3D GV seminar series. Uh, Wenping is currently uh, the, the department chair of the Department of Visualization at Tamu. He is on leave from University of Hong Kong. Uh, Wenping has done a lot of groundbreaking works across many, many fields, okay, including computer graphics, computer vision, visually. Uh, robotics, geometry modeling, etc., and he has been a role model okay, for young researchers, including me. Um, so he is a IEEE fellow and is the funding chairman of the Asian uh, Graphics um, Organization. Um, and without further ado, let's welcome Wen Pi. Thank you, thank you, Chixing. Or uh... Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share our works on 3D reconstruction. Uh, first, I want to double check uh, as far as uh, I can hear you and see you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Okay. So I move forward. Uh, in this, uh, uh, in the next uh, 40 or 15 minutes, I will present two pieces of works, both on 3D reconstruction. Uh, one is very practical. Another one is, or I think is at the frontier of uh, using a neural network approach for 3D surface reconstruction. All right, the first part is how we can develop an efficient imaging and reconstruction pipeline for our archeological applications, or in particular how to reconstruct those archeological fragments. All right, our computer graphics in general and visual computing are, have been used in archeological applications for a long time from VR, our scanning and 3D modeling. Uh, th this is a very important uh, application uh, area uh, in particular, one application we're interested in is to develop our efficient imaging system to uh, scan this uh, uh, uncovered uh, artifacts. Uh, these are very valuable to archeological study of our human past. So the purpose is to document, analyze, assembling all these fragments and to study <clears throat> their history to understand our past. Uh, of course, it is a challenging task in several senses. First, these pieces are, are highly regular, are uh, different sizes, a large quantity, a very weak texture. So 3D reconstruction are, uh, with high throughput of such uh, artifacts are, is never easy. Uh, what are you saying is the actual excavation our, our situation in Armenia in the past summer are uh, conducted by one of our collaborators uh, who is uh, our archaeologist uh, working at our uh, University of Hong Kong. He is a collaborator for this uh, research work I'm presenting. Uh, okay, so you see him here. I think there's another video. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, the guy at the forefront, his name is Peter uh, Cobb uh, is a professor in cardiology. Uh, he was leading a team in Armenia uh, to do all these pieces. Okay. All right, what are the technical challenges? Uh, think about it. If we have one piece or many pieces of this uh, uh, shirts referring to excavated fragments, what should we position them uh, during the scanning? We can imagine we can make them stand up, we can them lie down, and uh, maybe some other ways. Uh, I will keep you in suspension, try to guess what other different positions we could use for scanning. But even for standing up and lying down, as shown here, it's hard for us to scan the entirety of a piece because you always need something to hold the piece, or there is a board to put it on flat. So you always have to use more than one pass in order to scan uh, the entire geometry or surface of the object. So this makes it uh, 
the whole process is not so efficient. So here we should stand mode, the lie down mode. For example, if we stand up, then the manual operations needed for you to position them twice and scan in two pieces uh, with some postal processing and reconstruction, you later uh, piece the two 3D model together to get a complete model. This is a wide use approach. A line down approach, you can, uh, the advantage of a line down approach is that you can make multiple pieces or uh, uh, put it on flat bed and scan them. But they're always the front size, back size, we need to scan and reconstruct. Or uh, so, you could or uh, you could scan them in in a batch, or uh, with for example seven pieces here on the left. But once you got the front side, back side, we need to register the two sides together. The challenge is here is because those fragments are thin or flat, or uh, only the side strips are commonly visible in the two processes. That is the common areas or overlap area for registration is narrow, not big area. That's the only common area we have to rely on to perform reliable registration. That is a potential challenge. All right, so here we see our normally our hundreds, even thousands of fragments can be uncovered or every day. Uh, not only we need to develop a system that is easy to use, portable, affordable, not too expensive, we have to make sure the throughput, that is number of pieces we can process is sufficiently large, several hundred or thousands per day in order to make it uh, useful. There's one interesting note. Suppose a team of our scientists uh, went to Armenia to dig all these pieces uh, in one summer during the span of eight or seven weeks. Uh, if we cannot scan them to get 3D models, or uh, or uh, uh, in time during that period of work, then we don't have data because many countries don't allow scientists to, uh, to, uh, to, to move or take these pieces away. All you need to do here, otherwise in the summer you dig, but once you're back in university, you don't have access to those uh, 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 fragments artifacts because well, physically you cannot take it away digitally. If we don't have an efficient system, you cannot scan them are in time for reconstruction. So this is the dilemma we want to address. All right, related works are this uh, scanning are the are, 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 uh, archeological pieces has been one of important application computer graphics, even in uh, mainstream journals like CWAF and uh, TOG. Uh, here you're looking at the 3D scanner system. They are, uh, doing something similar, not necessarily uh, or threads, but called fresco. It is it's part of kind of a wall painting, and uh, it is a very slow process. They use a laser scanner that can only process one piece at a time, and also there are other works or uh, which can uh, you always need a manual operation. At least you need to take away uh, the model or or and replace other models and the scanning can be, can need to be careful and it take a long time. The throughput typically is from our several pieces a day to hundred a day. In this example, 40 pieces per day can be scanned. All right, now, our, this is not standing or lying, it's called hanging mode. That is, you need clippers, hand them to our, get all the pieces so that the camera are relatively camera can rotate around pieces. Theoretically, you can also process them are in fragments. This particular system can process our objects about 100 fragments per day because of the slow scanning process, as well as the relatively complex are, sorry, there are emails coming up, are relatively complex process <clears throat> of are hanging all these objects are when you transit from one batch to another. Our, the most recent work we can refer to is a talk paper in, I believe the print from Princeton. They use our approach that will be very similar to what we're doing. That is, they put multiple pieces 
or first the front size and then back size, of course, it is relative on the flat board. But what the difference is, uh, this system use uh, one camera trying to cover all these pieces from different angles. Therefore, their focus is on path planning, how to get rough geometry of these fragments, then spend a lot of time to carefully uh, plan the path of the camera moving over our, our, the pieces in order to make sure all the pieces will be observed sufficiently, or especially their size. So the throughput here is not very high, only several dozen, 20 something fragments per day. All right, our approach. So what do we aim at is to be able to scan later reconstruct over 1000 pieces per day. That means eight hours in the field, not in the lab. And uh, this indeed, we, our system uh, has achieved this uh, throughput. Uh, we achieved the accuracy about 0.14 millimeters in the lab. In the field, it's slightly higher, uh, but it is acceptable. Uh, I will discuss accuracy issue and the validation later. Our system uh, is quite affordable. Our, it's not a commercial system. It takes three cameras costing about 2,000 US dollars to set up. And it's uh, portable and uh, it has been applied, deployed in Armenia the past summer to achieve all this expected performance. Okay, it is use a batch mode scanning, front side, back side registration. Here is system overview. Our, on the left, you see there are three cameras facing a turntable. And then our, the turntable our, has a barcode so that we can use it to perform camera registration or more accurately for our reconstruction purposes using our MVS or more. Three cameras, turning table turns a full circle. It makes 16 stops in a full circle. It means that our time three, uh, for one side of this batch, 48 images will be taken. And uh, on the back side, same number of images will be taken. Then all these uh, images will be used together to perform piecewise reconstruction. So the end goal is to get complete 3D models of individual pieces. <clears throat> okay, this is a situation how this are uh, our equipment is being used in the field in Armenia. You can see that our, after finishing one batch, another board, our, you place them simultaneously, you can place them on, our, on the camera or from scanning. So this can make uh, the process of camera scanning and human our, our operations in parallel. Okay, now the pipeline itself. <clears throat> uh, from the left, uh, we're showing uh, the scanning process or the situation for the front side, back side of the same batch, same set of fragments of nine pieces. And uh, uh, on each side, uh, so you basically each side that do separate 3D construction. Of course, although 3D is only partial, is only the one side. Once you get both sides are uh, at the middle of this pipeline, you have 3D models of the front side, back side. Then uh, what we need to decide is among these nine pieces, which front side should match which back side because you don't want to mix up. So there is a global alignment problem. Once it's down, then uh, on the, to the right of the pipeline, uh, the correct matching of front and back side will be put together a uh, 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 fine, our registration will be performed using the overlapping area, which is the side region. Our, <clears throat> that needs to be done carefully because not much geometrical information is shared by both sides. Okay, more details here. First, segmentation. From the images, uh, we develop a simple neural network to extract the foreground. Uh, only the images for the fragments 
are made available to 3D construction. Uh, we use off the shelf MVS software uh, to perform 3D construction for each, <clears throat> each side. This is segmentation and uh, then uh, one side of this nine pieces will be uh, performed, reconstructed. On the right, there are 3D models, but not complete, only partial. Only on the side you can see. Then suppose for both sides, front side, back side, we perform 3D construction. So how to perform global alignment? Here, are, instead of using a brute force 3D searching, we take advantage of uh, the approximate 2D nature of the fragments. That is, these pieces, they're not flat, but they have the main direction, they look relatively flat, or imagine using PC analysis, we can approximate, uh, get roughly the top view of the piece to get the 2D silhouettes of these pieces. From the 2D silhouettes, uh, we perform a 2D control matching uh, to see which pair matches the best, as you can see here. Yeah, so we form these matchings. It means that the corresponding front side should be matched to the corresponding back side. Then use this information, we go for are <clears throat> the our final registration on the right. Okay, so yeah, this is a 3D registration based on a global initialization. Are the feature points along the boundary are only these points on the boundary are available because they are shared. They can be used for registration. Other parts are cannot be used for registration. So this is challenging in uh, achieving high accuracy. Now, now, how to validate the accuracy? So we need a ground truth. For this purpose, our, our, our my students actually bought five our, our five pots of pottery pieces. Uh, then uh, they are broke it up into smaller over hundred pieces. Or scan them using high our, our accuracy professional grade. Our scanner called our N scan. Uh, the scanning accuracy for this scanner is 0 0.04 millimeters. Uh, it's about five times or more accurate than our own fast imaging system. We use this result as one of truths for validation. Our uh, five pots, uh, by the way, are they forgot to take photo for one of the four pots, so you can see only four. These five ports are are, are, are broken, are they smashed it to get 133 fragments. Uh, it takes several days for them to use a professional grade scanner to scan them very carefully. This is a data set against which we validate our, our, our pipeline or system, see uh, how to achieve the better accuracy. All right, this is situation of scanning process in the lab to have you, to let you have a more our, our careful look to appreciate our, its working procedure. This is not our, the original speed, it exists <clears throat> times faster. Okay, all right. Our, then when you use two boards, therefore you don't waste the time waiting for the scanning to finish before you place the next boards. You can uh, try to process two boards, work them in parallel. And in this way, you can further increase the throughput by 20%, up to uh, 1,200 per day. All right, I've shown this over a situation, how many pieces normally can be executed every day. Uh, this is the site I showed you before. All right, system performance. First are the throughput. That is how many pieces can be scanned are in eight hours. So our system can achieve our throughput of 1,000 pieces per day. Our, our, we achieve the accuracy of 0 0.14 millimeters on uh, this uh, data set are in the lab. Our, of course, this really depends on many things. Our, our, the, environments are the lighting, all the thing. So in the real field application, the lighting is not that ideal, but it still achieve accuracy somewhere around uh, 0 0.2 millimeters. Uh, by the way, the question naturally is, if this is the limit, 
or is it possible to do even better in terms of accuracy? Since we're using our off the shelf, our uh, MBS software, actually uh, people are, we can find an answer in the literature. Uh, the general conclusion is uh, the current state of art are the um, multi view or uh, stereopsis technology can only achieve accuracy uh, relative to pixel size, one over 200 or uh, in that range. Uh, in our setting, we're using our resolution of 3K by 3K in our actual setting. We are able to achieve an accuracy of one over or uh, one in 400. I think this is pretty much in the range or uh, are of the our expected state of art accuracy. Our, so we're not really improving our accuracy. We just want to set up the system to make it work in an ideal manner to achieve expected accuracy. Uh, these are some of our reconstructed models are textured and not textured. Or some more. You can see the difference. So they're not exactly our flat pieces. So even in these challenging cases, our system can still are <clears throat> reliable to capture different aspects to make it visible and to allow a, a high quality 3D reconstruction in the pipeline. So, right, I will not uh, spend more time comparing details of various our uh, ICP versus our special or uh, customized ICP. Okay, but there are some important questions. The question is, are uh, <clears throat> why we use three cameras? The answer is that, are uh, in order to recover or uh, to scan these pieces in a complete manner, we need to make sure our uh, different cameras can position they have different height to cover different attitude, so the angles. Because the side is important, because the side is common area, the top is large area, also you don't want to miss it. There is an ablation study to validate that indeed using our three cameras or has a lot of advantage. Or of course, or in this setting, people say that, well, you could use two as well, but our, this is the only one study we want to play safe to our, make sure the top area will be covered. So we decided to use three. Another ablation study is the answer when you turn a full circle, how many images should, images should be taken? The more images you take, are uh, each stop for taking the photo takes a couple of seconds because it's closer time. You don't want to take too many images to, <clears throat> to slow down the process. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to take too few uh, images uh, to kind of uh, miss any uh, coverage. Our, this ablation study shows that 16 seem to be an ideal number, uh, empirically. Okay, of course, we validated the method uh, allowing different uh, number of pieces, a piece of different sizes, show that they work reasonably well in all these situations. And our, these pieces, of course, are supposed to be put together. If they can be identified to belong to the same object to form the, the port, on the right, or a portrait on the right, but I want to make clear how to get this complete model on the right is not a focus of our pipeline, but definitely it's an interesting area for further research. There are, are existing works, many of them. I remember that uh, about uh, more than 10 years ago, our, our Xi Qing, our, uh, uh, Xi Qing Huang, and, uh, the host of my talk, has our, our, our very impressive work in 3D cases of our assembling 3D pieces are at <clears throat> okay. That will be for sure. Limitations is a common limitation is, uh, uh, is uh, it, it, when for this kind of our, our archaeological shirts, when they are very weak in texture or texture lays, of course, our, our MVS approach will not do a very good job to get a 3D model. Our, uh, we just, there could be some practical solutions like are uh, using spring or other techniques, but they're not really very uh, profound observation. Okay. Well, uh, basically we have developed an well, efficient or high speed imaging system that can scan the 3D pieces in images, not only fast, but also in high quality, high quality uh, enough 
to allow a robust 3D reconstruction or for getting 3D models of the pieces later. All right, also we provide our, and our data set. So to our validate our system, our the quality, and that could have also be used for future research. All right, I finished my first part. And uh, Peter, uh, should I go ahead to go to the second part? Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So we can... so I'm still pretty much on time. All right. Okay. The second part are is also about a 3D construction, but it is a totally different nature. Or it doesn't have much practical applications, not yet. So the basic idea of the problem is how to uh, reconstruct a 3D uh, surface or from uh, a bunch of input uh, images. This is a typical problem formulation, but we would like to uh, study our, 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 our neural <coughs> based approach or based on neural rendering. So some bare bone. Our, Given the geometrical model image, uh, now it's a very active research topic to use our, our, ML, our MLP or our similar fully connected neural network to encode this image contents of geometry. The, the idea is through training, the neural network will be remembered corresponding to each location. Could it be a pixel? Could it be three location? What is the color value? What is the, our, 3D occupancy, whether it's on surface or inside, outside. Our, the immediate, our immediate advantage of this is our neural network provide natural, continuous and smooth representation compared with traditional discrete representation like voxels, point cloud. And uh, of course, uh, this are uh, in uh, many cases, a neural network are just use a relatively small number of weight parameters to encode the geometry image. That could mean the efficient our, our way of compressing our information. Okay, our, this is uh, our, our, the, the, our situation of using this idea, but instead of encoding uh, the geometry directly, a neural network representation can be uh, embedded in a computational neural network to try to infer 3D geometry or, or the normal views are of the scene using our a 3D representation. Here on the left, the input images, calibrated camera positions. On the right, our, everything looks 3D, but I want to make a difference. Our, this is a typical situation our, <clears throat> of the problem studying in NERF and its environments. On the right, it looks like a 3D output, it's not. On the right, on top, there are just to the images output, our, not rendered directly from a highly accurate 3D model. The neural network is able to provide normal views. So this problem is called normal view synthesis. But still, inside neural network, if we want to dig in, there is a rough 3D model that can be extracted. It's not so well defined. Or there are many or messy details. So this method are really are not targeted for 3D reconstruction. But at the same time, recently, uh, I listed two papers from CBPR and NIPS uh, last year, DVR, IDR. They uh, developed a neural network approach to uh, derive uh, 3D surfaces from 2D observations using differentiable surface rendering. The key is surface rendering. They overall generate uh, high quality results, but there are also some obvious problems I want to discuss. Let me fix our, this our thing, all right? All right, so in this differential, our differentiable surface rendering scheme, uh, you simulate the camera, camera rays will be shot into the scene and we need to find an intersection between the ray and surface. But the surface I know, it will be reconstructed. So therefore a lot of gas and a correction. But remember in this situation, the internal model eventually the model that is being optimized and eventually used to present a surface itself is a surface. Therefore, a, a, a re-surface intersection is needed and, and it's computed differentiable manner. So you found intersection, try to compare your guess with the ground truth that 2D images, if it's not correct, 
you feed back, it's a back propagation, you optimize your surface position. That's called guessing and improving, and this is how it works. All right, the problem is this, this kind of methods highly depends on initialization. So on the right, as you can see that, suppose our, the real surface is a blue solid line on the right. But if the camera is moving around looking for that surface, uh, then the neighboring rays will identify those yellow solid lines at the true surface, but there is a gap, there is a hole. If there is a hole, means there is a sudden change of the depth value for the ray. But for surface-based method, it's very hard for them to use log optimization to jump from this yellow surface into the blue surface. They tend to stay locally. That's called being stuck in local minimum. They tend to suggest this dashed blue curve could be a solution, but no, our, the real true blue solution is far back. So this is a problem of lack of ability in a more global manner of optimization for this surface-based method. So we want to develop method based on, on some inspiration we got from NERF uh, volume rendering. In volume rendering, uh, in NERF, their interest, the original interest is not for surface construction, but for normal view synthesis. So they use a volume rendering approach, the geometry is represented in the volume. So in order to uh, represent normal views to render this volume, of course, we have to use recasting. That is along each ray determined by pixel, we have to perform integration to accumulate the voxel color, uh, sorry, uh, uh, yeah, the colors and density values along the ray or along the voxels or uh, on the voxels along the ray to have final accumulated color. It's, it's a volume rendering, volume representation. Uh, the, uh, the rendering process is not about ray surface dissection, but rather is accumulation of volumetric elements. It get great results. What's the message? It's very robust. It's, it's not easy to get uh, into local minimum. It has high quality output. Uh, so we want to, uh, to, to have the advantage of that uh, robust, robust uh, optimization. But uh, it's only good, NERF is only good for non view synthesis. If um, there is internally a volume-based representation, pretty much like a voxel, a density-based representation, if we use a margin cube to extract its geometry, that can be delivered by NERF, or uh, the geometric quality is not very high. As you can see on the right, there are many massive details, but these details are hidden by texture, but from other views, they look all right. So now our, on top, we have surface-based rendering. We do want surfaces in the end, but we don't like to use surface our, all the way in the process. Our, at the bottom, it's volume-based rendering. This focus is not on surface representation. So we want to combine these two approaches. So the basic idea is, all right, we have a surface representation, surface rendering. We have volume representation, volume rendering. So in our new approach, we want our method to our uh, internally, our uh, through the volume representation, we want to impose an explicit surface presentation during the pipeline of learning, and then uh, the rendering process is not about re-surface intersection, rather rely on robust volume rendering approach. So basically, we married uh, the merits of these two approaches to see how well they can work together to produce better results. So in this case, uh, on the right, we're able to jump through uh, the hole to reach the ideal destination. All right, before I show the technical details, the methodology, I want to give you some glimpse on the results. As you can see that from our the reference, from the input images, actually there are about 50 or 40 images like this, or not just one, this one is reference image, and IDR, which is surface-based, approach NERF that produce the quality of our the output of quality not as good as what we're able to achieve on the right for surface construction. Okay, little bit of details here, very quickly. 
And the essence of method is to represent a surface using sine distance the function. That is, we assume it is a watertight surface. It has a, a sine distance the function. And this sine distance function is not just defined in the post processing stage. It's initialized at the beginning. Our, the entire our learning process is try to learn indirectly this sine disk function. So in the end, we're able to extract a zero level set or of this SDF to get a surface. So how to learn sine disk function. This sine disk function could uh, induce a density distribution in the volume. The density distribution are uh, in the volume, uh, they can be assigned voxel colors to lead to pixel colors through the volume rendering. And uh, this is a, a typical volumetric rendering pipeline. The only difference is we not only we use a volume representation, but behind it, we have a primary underlying surface representation defined in terms of SDF. So, so SDF gives us volume density in the neighborhood of the surface. All right, uh, this is basically our review of the NERF uh, could use for convenient reference. I, I skipped it for the moment. Okay, now, our, look, our, I, what's important, uh, there, there are some math details our, we can't cover it here. I, I want to give you a situation. What, is this a straightforward idea? Can we just implement this, get results and show that it's better? Actually, it's not that uh, straightforward. The process is not that smooth because uh, let me use uh, the figure on the right to explain uh, what uh, is a potential challenge here. Uh, on the right, so for illustration purposes, we are using our lower dimensional illustration, uh, 1D, 2D. So our, the vertical dashed line, the red line, uh, is the position of the surface. Okay, is the position surface. Imagine uh, the surface. And then uh, the red bell-shaped curve is the SDF function of the surface. Okay. And of course, this SDF, we can make it symmetric because our, our defined bell shape is easy. Okay. Not normalizing. Our, okay. The, the, the street line, the blue street line SDF, but it's induced our natural our SDF density function our, with a peak at the surface location using the red, or let me see. Do you, I don't know. Uh, Peter, can you see the cursor here? Can you see it? No? Hello? Can you see the yeah, cursor? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so I use this. So, sorry, take your time. So this is at the F function. This is a density function, the red curve directly defined, but we know that for any volume representation, we need to perform recasting to accumulate all the voxel from the ray. The recasting process basically is a process of integration using some width function here, W, width function, to combine all the colors along the ray and the density. But then if we use a simple approach like this, then we realize that they are, it, it, we realize that they, our weight function will take the shape of this bell shape green curve, but this peak value is not the same as the surface location, which is bad. Why? Because if we believe this is where the surface is at this our, our red line, then the weight should have the largest response, give it largest weight here to encourage the convergence to convert to here. But the weight function always have are a peak value somewhere in front of our true surface. Uh, this is a problem with a straightforward implementation. So the error is not big, it's noticeable, but it needs to be understood and fixed. What will be the ideal framework to define this weight function? Uh, uh, I, I want to introduce two concepts here without going through detail. First, we need to really go deep to define a new weight function to modify the rendering framework to achieve two purposes. First, this width function needs to be unbiased. That is, the peak response of the width function should be exactly at location of the surface, because this is where you want to give the largest weight to the color, 
of the surface in order to converge the right location. That's called unbiased. Second, occlusion aware. Imagine if you have a complex geometry with multiple level surfaces and only the front surface should be visible, but the ray should go through the surface and further to intersect the other layers of surfaces, there will be integration. But according to common sense, uh, we are assuming the objects are not translucent or transparent, only the front surface that close to the eye or camera should have largest response. The surface at the back, this should not have larger weights. That's called occlusion aware. All this need to be uh, are achieved. For example, on the left, the local response is correct. The peak is always at the top, but considering the camera is camera rays going from left to right. So the second surface should, surface should have a smaller response. This is called occlusion aware. Okay, so we need to combine the both. Our, I will go through the solution. There is some duration and we did have some headache after finding out the problem and trying to get the right solution. And uh, then to, okay. If they are going through, without going through details, how we found a solution, how to rigorously derive the solution, the key message is this. If you have a SDF function, the weight function should not be defined as a bell-shaped uh, density symmetrically positioned over the zero level set. Rather, the density function induced by the SDF of the surface should take a sigma shape. That is, overall, if we know that's where a surface is, then out of the surface, the weight should be small, but on the other side, inside the surface, and the our density should continue increasing are to indicate, it's more like a smooth version of indicator function, okay? So the surface location should be ideally positioned in the middle of a translation location in order to correctly apply conventional volume rendering approach for the learning framework to get the correct result. This is the takeaway and the conclusion. All right, our, I'll skip all this derivation analysis and our, for the sake of time, right? It's 46 minutes already. All right, this is a comparison. Are uh, the red surface and then the uh, red response curve W will not be used. Instead, use the, the orange curve, the top. And this is the discrete version because we need to discretize these uh, functions in order to perform them on the voxel value. Uh, for actual computational implementation. Okay, our, as you can see here, our, our on the right is very useful illustration. This zigzag blue curves, they are SDF functions. Positive, negative, zero means surface location. Then positive again means that we're going from inside to outside. This is along a ring, okay. Then our, according to SDF, according to our proposal, the corresponding opacity density function uh, should be defined in the sigma mode uh, monotonically. And then the, the weight function will be not only correct with the maximum at surface location, also uh, for the surfaces hidden behind, the responses should be lower, not higher. So this is illustration. Now, are finally, I'm able to discuss some results uh, over details. So on the left, there are represented the images of the input. <clears throat> are in the middle, are we show the actual our zero level set <clears throat> of SDF function learned in this learned in this framework. And of course, once you got the geometry, you you can also perform or, or perform or do a normal view synthesis. More results are. I think here, this, I'm sure that one image is. Okay, uh, we compare the result with RDR, our third column, the surface-based approach, and NERF, NERF is the volume rendering, are, of course, to be fair, it's not really volume rendering for surface because uh, we are, are among the first are to use a volume rendering for surface our representation, but there is a concurrent work are from Yarum Lipman's group uh, at the same time, 
are called, I think, uh, volume SDF. Uh, by the way, our work, uh, we call it news, and uh, Yaron's work, both will be presented later at the NIPS. Our... Okay, how to move forward? You know, I, I got stuck here. All right, so here we see that our, our reconstruction framework can also be used our, to reconstruct challenging objects like this our thin structure. So these uh, features are not rich. You have only wires and the wires have a small dimension. Our, also it's a mixed scenario, not only thin structures, you have a general object also in the same. This can be our, our reconstruction our pipeline can handle this kind of geometry, all right? This is a comparison with our, our other approaches, including a conventional approach to core map uh, that is our MVS uh, pipeline. Okay, remember earlier, I spent some time to explain why we need to fix some bias issue. If we do not propose or use our modified, our weight function using just a simple naive SDF function and combine it with volume rendering, then that's called naive our solution on the left. It still works, but uh, uh, the, <clears throat> uh, this bias leads to larger geometric error of 1.68 millimeters compared with our full model or show on the left, the error is less than half, 0.72 millimeters for this model. It shows the significance of our, of this our weight function, our proposal. All right, and by the way, there is the implementation, implementation detail. Uh, the network should be initialized. We use a sphere for initialization, similar to sphere, our, for all the objects you want to reconstruct. This initialization makes a big difference in terms of efficiency of uh, convergence, okay. So without that, uh, the network, will take a longer time to form desired geometry as you can visualize from the cross section. All right, this is illustration of very challenging geometric model, a Duran. I think not many people here in Texas are familiar with this, I guess. No, uh, but a challenging model. And uh, this our video sequence shows the our intermediate geometric shapes are, we can found in our reconstruction pipeline. All right, more results are using DTU model. Reconstruction and normal view synthesis. Using different uh, blended MVS data set. All right, limitations. Again, our features, our uh, texture is important in our regions not well lit, our texture is very weak. Our methods still are demonstrate a lot of problems. Our, so our, of course, our efficiency is another issue as commonly shared by our many current our, our neural our rendering based approach. Our, our, all right. Okay, this is the final page. I would like to thank all my collaborators and students who have are made a great contribution to this work. They're from Hong Kong U and MPI and also Louisiana State University. Thank you, I'll finish it here. Okay, thanks. Thanks Wenbin for the wonderful talk. Now we enter into the, the panel session. Uh, uh, so we have uh, two panelists, uh, Yin Yang and Xi Feng Gao um, joining us for, for this panel uh, session. So the panel session works as this, right? So we first have uh, one round of uh, multiple rounds of questions uh, regarding the talk. Then we open the discussion to more general topics. Uh, this is a very exciting time at the intersection of uh, geometry force and deep learning. Uh, so we will open the discussion to more general topics. So first of all, I would like to uh, hand this to our panelists if they have questions regarding the talk. Maybe Yin, you can start first. 
Right. Uh, thanks, Wenping, for for this wonderful presentation. I I have learned a lot, you know, and some of the you know the the the, the conclusions is also very inspiring for my own research. And I do have a, a few 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 uh, probably not questions, just uh, maybe maybe could potentially and uh, lead to some open discussions. And uh, for the very first project you just mentioned about the archaeology and the uh, uh, reconstruction stuff. So I noticed that um, in most cases, you know, the target uh, the, are kind of thin pieces, right, and of irregular shapes, right. So, and uh, have you tried to use your your system and for some, and for instance, what happens if uh, the one fragment it's in a kind of symmetric and a more regular uh, shape, like almost a circle or almost a rectangle? If that is the case, will, will that brings you any? Uh, difficulties in the follow up in the follow up lineup. No, right. I think so. I think so. And uh, I think uh, to push this chain, uh, suppose uh, we dig the, our 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 basically what we're saying is, uh, if the front side, back side, the shape are are, are similar, it's an interesting question. They're regular, so that are uh, it's very hard to find. The correct frontings. I think uh, when you scan one side, uh, if there's no feature, then suppose you have a white circular disk, all right, then I think forget about it, right? Even a regular textureless piece, you can only reconstruct the boundary, not inside, because no feature, right? But what if uh, you do have features, but they're highly identical, different pieces? then the difficulty you might be referring to in the later stages, the front side, back side cannot be, because I have nine pieces front side, another nine pieces flip over back side, then the, your scenario will confuse me to find the correct global matching. So I might match one front side to the wrong uh, back side. So then this is a combinatorial error. We cannot get over. This okay. is what I can think of, yeah. Okay. Okay. Also, uh, during uh, in this in this project, have you ever uh, considered about the thickness of each fragment, or you just consider them is uh, is uh, is afraid of any thickness, or there is is so the actually the alignment between the segments is it's a it's a it's not just a line registration, right? It's not just line. It's it's kind of a, a tiny slim surface registration. Am I right? Uh, or you just uh, but there there are several there are several registrations maybe it's confusing okay. and <clears throat> once the front side back side 3d models are are, are are finished we want to put them together right front side back side put together uh -huh. both 3d models and for this problem there are already two registration problem first globally align <clears throat> correct front to back okay this is the one registration but when you align them together, it doesn't mean that are close to each other. You still have to do 3D refined registration to make sure that's ICP, to make sure it's aligned together. Okay. The first registration, how to perform correct combinatorial matching, we reduce 3D models into 2D profiles. I see. We compare that only approximate matching to tell this front and that back should belong to the same object. Okay. Of course, there's an the error because pieces are not flat. Even the situation you mentioned, if they're all circular, it got confused. But in our case, it's because we're lucky, they're random in unique ways. We match them together. But then after that, we use that initialization. At least the, the, in one dimension, they're closely aligned together as a global initialization. And then, then after that, we'll perform a second stage registration using ICP. But our, this stage, has something to do with thickness. I see. Because thickness means that how much area available on the side, that is the only area common to both front and back. Yeah, so if it's very thin, maybe we don't have much point. But if it's so thin, this is like a curve. Again, it's easy, right? It's curve situation. But the problem is, it's not very thin, but still it's an area you need to explore. And plus that, the angle, the lighting may not be good. The points or other information observed from there are not reliable. These are the main source of 
or the geometric error. Yeah, on the side. The thickness is a very tricky issue. If it's very yeah. thick, we're also happy, right? Because right, they're right, right, right. easily observed so many features. Because yeah. ICP has only six degrees of freedom, we don't need so many reliable points. But, ah, yeah, that's yeah. true, that's yeah. true. Okay, okay, thank you very much. And also, I, I really like the, the high level uh, the idea of your of your of your um, the, the the next the second project it's um it's fascinating uh, the, it, it is a uh, this year's a, a new IPS right yeah yeah the, this uh, has you know recently accepted to NIPS yeah okay okay so I do have a kind of uh, um uh, the, the not that technical question but um so far uh as far as I, I know, you know, most, you know, differentiable stuff, in, including differentiable rendering, differentiable simulation, right? Those are kind of the hot topics, but, you know, most of them are just uh, primarily rely on the first order. It's it just the, the, the reuse of the BP in many cases, right? Back propagation. So do you think um, the, this type of work, including yours, and the could benefit and the, if uh, that we are able to somehow to achieve um, the second order, so we are able to evaluate the Hessian of the objective function, and we can have some uh, more fine tunement uh, during the optimization. What What's your thought on, on this type of? Uh, yeah, I have thought about it because we have a current or uh, ongoing project or uh, to reconstruction. We're trying to improve efficiency. Or uh, I'm, of course, the only my student who got hands dirty. Right, I observe, talk to them. I think the answer to a question is not optimistic. Okay. Uh, so for example, first of order, you are talking about gradient descent, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if for conventional small scale compared with machine learning optimization problem, uh, things are available. For example, our gradient descent, then our, our, then this is, our, there are many, uh, I can name a few, Gaussian Newton, for example, LBFGS, Cosin Newton, and you talk about Hessian. Hessian is really the full Newton. All this available. But you can think about, I use this, I use that. There's a trade off, uh, and maybe slower. We talk about it. I had the experience in the conventional setting, but in machine learning, is very different. Why? If there are so many data points. So, in a way, we can, in every iteration, we can't even put all the observation data points of sampling points together. We have to use a batch to process. It means that we basically want to optimize it, the data points, we divide data points in different batches. In every iteration, we use different batches. So this makes it a very local version. I'll give you an example. Suppose we think, well, Gaussian-Newton may be expensive and are, are even, it has things more expensive, right? You have inversion of this. What about LBFGS? LBFGS is very simple. Just update, just update very fast. But there's a problem. LBFGS rely on history. That for example, you need to remember the gradient of the previous five steps. But if in the previous five steps, you are using different subsets of data for as batches. Okay, the history is not relevant. Okay. In the conventional setting, you are working on a fixed same set of data, iterate again and again. But for machine learning, basically we normally, that's why we use gradient or descent. Even in that case, it's not a full version because we never consider the full data set too large. We select a subset, we perform stochastic. Okay, so it's only some directions are being optimized, next round, some other directions. And it's a surprise. It's not very fast, but it converts robustly. So this batch mode switching directions, if you are statistic, you are always looking for different subset of directions for descent, then this history cannot be used for LBFGS in a straightforward manner. And for Hessian, I think somebody I hope can find some breakthrough in a machine learning setting, but I don't know when. But even in the conventional setting, I don't think for large scale problem, even for curve fading, for mesh generation, people are really using Hessian. I think are not even Gaussian Newton. I think the most popular approach is still Gaussian Newton. Uh, sorry, Gaussian Newton, LBFGS. But LBFGS are cannot be used so easily for training large neural network.
Hmm. Sorry, it's a long answer because uh, I have thought a lot about it, but really at the end, I have to admit, I have no good answer. Yeah, I think it's hard. Yeah. That's interesting to know. Actually, um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, actually we are working on some high order differentiable stuff and, uh, and our recent uh, result is able to evaluate uh, the arbitrary high order differentiation of whatever function uh, without addition. Uh, in general, you know, we considered, you know, computing uh, the differentiation of uh, a function and uh, the complexity will go up depends on the order of the differentiation. But that would be it, great. That, that would be great through. That's something um, in yeah. our world. I don't think, yeah. Right, for instance, and you mentioned about um, the, the, the Newton's method, right? But, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can use something like uh, the Krilov iteration, uh, which is a Hessian free, but it's still second order, right? Then oh, what, what okay. we do is that we can just keep evaluating uh, the directional direct derivative of the function along a certain direction, which okay. is not a full Hessian, it's a kind of projected Hessian, right? Yeah, and yeah, then, I have to me. yeah. So, so, and also, it's also possible. I understand that you know, if the optimization parameter are huge, and the, then the, the problem is in high dimensional, it could be problematic. But what if we only select a few more important parameter to fine tune instead of run a full version of the second order optimization, but just a kind of subset of the parameter to run a second order? Yeah. So I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Full full has to mean so all directions considered, but you can right. choose. Uh, a small number of directions, but uh, instead of a go gradient, you want to use high order information, but right, a small right. number of select directions. That's a very neat idea. I've never thought about it. Yeah, but uh, I think uh, it sounds like you have already got the result. It sounds promising. Yeah, yeah but not it. in the context of the, the, the 3D reconstruction. So I, I, I'm kind of want to hear your feedback or your thought, you know, whether this uh, is kind of a no, worse a direction uh, or... <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to start discouraging because uh, I, based on my response on my limited experience, but since I have been thought or haven't dared to think about this new possibility, like her, uh, I think it's, I get your point. You still go harder, but you don't have to do uh, all directions, right? right? Similarly, in same spirit, our stochastic uh, gradient descent is I still use gradient but I don't use all gradients at the same time, all directions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, step by step, I believe for that's definitely are some interesting errors. I have thought about it. I never come up with this idea. I always think Hessen is very, very nice for teaching in classroom, in practice, <laughs> don't touch it. This has been my old thinking, yeah. But I could be wrong because you have a new way to get over that. Okay, so thanks, Ying, uh, for, for the questions. Uh, thanks for me for the answers. So maybe now we open the questions to Shifeng. Do you have questions regarding the talk? So we do have uh, 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 questions on YouTube, which will, uh, but that is more high level, which we'll ask later. Okay. Okay, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks, Prof Professor Wang, for giving such a great talk, both practical and very uh, exciting. So these topics, you know, recently, I, I, I recently started to look at this, uh, especially the differential rendering, this related stuff, because it's highly related to what I'm doing right now. So uh, yes, and uh, I, have, I have questions uh, running to the uh, technical details of the two talks, uh, the two parts. The first one is, uh, uh, I thought when you, when, you know, when the workers, they place the uh, each pieces of the shed, they should have the, already have the correspondence, right? Uh, when you're talking about the first uh, matching, the combinatorial matching to uh, match the pairs back and front. So- Yes or no, if there are only one pieces that can remember, if you have nine or 20 pieces that you can see in some case, there are small pieces. And if you deal with this 1000 piece a day, or uh, you prefer automatic solution, right? Uh, if yeah, you but, have a super memory, you say that I remember this and that, but yeah, you don't think about it, you, you manually, but here what we propose is fully automatic, yeah. Oh, but, but the thing is, I, I remember I, I saw you, you show one example that uh, on, on one board, you, uh, the worker, the, uh, she plays like nine pieces 
and mm. it's like for example this uh, facing down and then after taking uh, finishing the uh, the the uh, pictures they mm -hmm. flip it and then with the same location right they, they, they have the oh, it's no? same but yes if there you you are saying nine but imagine they could use four or three and in that case you are right you can remember pretty here but if there are big small pieces over 20 i have another slides you didn't notice or in the video they're small and okay. uh, maybe you shuffle them around move around you don't want them to say that you must put it exactly if you shift by two sides, all these are not good. They're okay. not doing okay. the only ones. They're doing so many times. They're thousand pieces a day. So it's always better to, well, it's, they can still try to remember, but uh, we provide automatic. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not saying by remember, it's uh, more like, uh, you know, you have the, uh, you have the ca camera parameters. Oh, do you use camera parameters? For... We do, we do, we do. So I say you, you, your requirement is when you flip back, make sure you don't change the location. Yeah, yeah don't change the yeah, order. Yeah. This is something I wish they can always do and accurate enough, right? It's not possible to be perfect. Oh, but, I see. Uh, I see. You yeah, small, yeah. Just, yeah, okay. But we propose solution. If you are not following that strictly, it's okay. If you randomly shuffle them, it's also okay. <laughs> by the way, by the way, uh, I briefly mentioned the previous work is a talk paper from Princeton using similar batch-based flip mm -hmm. over approach, yeah, but they yeah. use the camera to plan mm -hmm. to, to like fly over to do this path planning. Mm -hmm. In that paper, they mentioned clearly how to match front and back is the open problem. We <laughs> did it manually. Okay. Okay. Because if you claim you can solve it, then you can solve it in any situation. They say no, we didn't solve it. Mm. Right. Okay, great. Uh, thanks a lot. It's so, not a complex idea. We use a 2D uh, uh, contour matching. Uh -huh. I don't think it's even great novelty, but it's very practical. Yeah. People don't have to scratch their heads like I forgot exact word mm -hmm. it is not. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's very practical. And uh, it's uh, since the the pieces are um, a thing are uh, mostly, uh, you know, not exactly flat, but close to flat. So their their two D controls they are quite different. So uh, you can based on that to do the matching. I, uh, I tell you, I know this is the public forum. Or maybe it's, I'm sound like uh, I'm sounding like whining. We started this work two years ago. We mm -hmm. finished the year ago. We submitted to CBOF. Okay, so that's before we we put the system in Armenia for field test. So. We believe our paper is very practical. It's the first, we increase throughput by 10 times to meet mm -hmm. the needs, accuracy is good. But our paper is not accepted. There are two main reasons. It's not normal. You are using an off bookshelf software. Everything is engineering and uh, novelty. When I say, well, yeah, I don't want to argue it here, but anyway, first problem, yeah. Second is, you said it's 1,000 pieces a day, but in your lab, you only did it 100 pieces in one hour. How can you prove it can be? Well, in the lab to do 100 pieces, we have 132 pieces, right? I mean, to all this, we could have more. But we submit a paper before we, this is Super of Asia, before we put system in mania. So they don't believe it's useful. Uh, it, it's, yeah. But now we have more evidence, but I don't know whether I should go back to Super of or just submit it to. Oh, you haven't summoned uh, yes. yes. Then you can you can I don't try know it. So about novelty, yes, but I believe there's some novelty. Mm -hmm. We're not just do novelty for novelty because the, this work is not is interesting. I just want to do it. Is there yeah. is a task? I could have a better idea, but that idea could be a different paper, it has nothing to do with the project. Forget about it. Everything is around in this goal to do the accurate enough, very fast, and easy to use and cheap. It's a very practical project. So yeah, I think yeah. it has its value, but maybe not a value shared by CBOF community. Yeah. Well, maybe for the interest of time, maybe, maybe, maybe Shikun, you can ask the second question. Because <laughs> okay. we, and we also have online questions to, uh, to ask. Okay, 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 I see. Then uh, then I'll, I'll ignore the, I skip my uh, other questions regarding to the first uh, part there. So for the second part, so I'm wondering, uh, yes, your uh, US, 
can extract 3D uh, mesh, 3D model. Uh, it's uh, you know is a uh, very good quality. So I'm wondering how you put the colors on it. Uh, like, uh, do you need to you need to have UVs, right? No, no. The, it's, uh, the color is not defined by the traditional like uh, texture mapping, mm -hmm. because the colors initially provided the input images, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we are still use a volume representation, are for for learning the geometry of the surface. Yes. So therefore, there is always the volume, and there is neural network encoding the volume. At every location of query, if mm -hmm. you input X Y Z, okay, mm -hmm. and, and there is always the feedback of the density and the color. Uh, so the color is learned from the images. Mm -hmm. Now, eventually, the density will converge to around the neighborhood of a true surface. And behind it, we put the SDF there. Mm -hmm. Okay, It I encourages see. the SDF. The SDF is down. SDF, the surface will be attracted. Then every surface point has a definite location in the original volume. We go back to the volume. We can find out the learned mm -hmm. color. Yeah. OK, got it. Yeah. So it has nothing to do with the UV coordinates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how to do it more efficiently in general, consistent manner as mesh representation, that'll be interesting, right? Eventually, after reconstruction, you want to give that to downstream to the pipeline. So how to get UV map from mm -hmm. this result? Yeah, we, we, we didn't consider that so far. We just okay. rendered that for you to see. Okay. Okay, I see. So, so basically, uh, I'm wondering, uh, by getting the color in this way, uh, is there any noise? How, how smooth about the colors? It depends on the uh, uh, the input quality. The input quality means the image quality, also accuracy of camera calibration. Mm -hmm. uh, in this work, we assume all the posts are calibrated. If a camera camera calibration is not good, it's never perfect. There are always mismatch, right? Because yeah, yeah, model yeah, images yeah. looking at the same point, they are not the same point of what color should be given to this location. But optimization trying to learn this in the best way possible. So, I see. Yeah, it's really depends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So last question. Uh, so um, I see your your work is uh, uh, you uh, based on the volumetric uh, rendering. So uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it produce. Uh, it can guarantee the output mesh is uh, what tight uh, since we can always use much yeah. fuel to extract yeah. the surface. Mm -hmm. And also there's uh, a surface intersection free. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm wondering for the surface based uh, differential rendering techniques, uh, they also uh, has good advantages. And uh, yes, uh, I agree that the surface based differential rendering can produce uh, intersecting you know, uh, triangles and so on. But we can we can use uh, existing tech uh, techniques to fix the intersections, right? Can you repeat the question? I, I didn't really quite. Uh, I think you are saying that. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I use not tight surface, but those people use explicit surface. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I so, don't get the point. Yeah, it's not a question. It's more like uh, for the surface based, uh, you know, differential rendering. We can combine the uh, self intersection uh, techniques, uh, you know, self intersection resolving techniques uh, to uh, remove the self intersections. Then it also can produce nice uh, surface, right? Yeah, it, in general, the surface quality for those uh, differential rendering surfaces in general is very good. Uh, yeah. I don't think our self intersection is an issue. What I mean is when you learn it, uh, learn the geometry, okay, if in the same, there is sudden change of depth. Sudden change depth means that for this pixel, the intersection here, if we move the pixel by one position, the ray will go to a position that is far back. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yes, yes, yes. Sudden jump of all this, coherence mm -hmm. of geometry. Okay, this is, because if you want to optimize, you have to provide initialization, okay, to, improve it. Yeah. This initialization, yeah. if it's a bit far from truth, locally, when there's sudden change of depth, then the optimization step has difficulty fixing it. Okay. Mm -hmm. For volume-based approach, it doesn't have a bias. Initialize something very general, volume is able to move 
everywhere because in that entire space. So relatively, it's more robust in, when yes, there is yeah. a sudden change of depth. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, yep. thanks, Shivan, for, for the questions. Thanks, Gundi, for the answers. So I have one short question, then we go move to the next round. So regarding the first part, uh, when you do uh, when doing the registration, do you use the um, the, the texture information or just geometry? Here, only geometry. Oh, oh okay, yeah. Yeah, because so we use texture already in the first round. When we reconstruct, the front side 3D model from the 48 images. This is where texture information are used to MVS to construct the 3D model front side. Then we got a back side. When the front side, back side put together, only geometry information are used there. No, this is how, what we do. No. Okay, thanks, Wenping. Uh, so we have a, 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 a bunch of questions from, from YouTube. Uh, so it's related. It's more high level relating. It's uh, asking the, uh, for example, the role of this kind of three D reconstruct three D information for two D uh, recognition, right? For example, uh, in current two uh, D visual recognition, we do not actually recognize the three D information from the image, and to do the inference. Uh, so the question is really about. Uh, is, is it beneficial to do so, right? To first do the 3D reconstruction, then perform inference to understand, uh, to understand the image, okay. I prefer to let other experts answer this question first. I have done my answering quite a bit. Okay, so maybe Yin, do you have any thoughts about this uh, 3D uh, reconstruction for, for, for this kind of, in general, visual, visual recognition, right? I, I'm not really an, an hardcore uh, reconstruction guy. Maybe Shifun can provide some. <laughs> I, I, I so, but uh, generally I think, you know, for this 3D reconstru reconstruction, we need a lot of input images from different mm -hmm. uh, angles, mm -hmm. right? So if for 2D, if you already have this, you can directly compare the, the difference between different images. And to maybe it's even more direct, right? Rather than because from 2D to 3D, there are already a lot of errors and issues. And then you, you go back to 2D to, to, to try to compare them. I don't know. I think <laughs> for 2D, their, their requirement, uh, their requirement for the accuracy is more much higher. Yeah, so my thought is that we we need to, to, to do this, we need uh, data sets for like uh, reconstructing in the wild, right? So for example, like uh, in graphics, we focus on reconstructing a specific environment using the sensors, but for 2D, uh, for 2D visual recognition, we do need uh, data sets that can reconstruct in this kind of natural images, right? We improve the depth. We don't really have the data sets to do that yet. Uh, Right, so there does the workshops with them as ICV uh, reconstruction in the wild, right? So, but I think uh, in general, this field is at the very initial stage. Okay, all right. So the, the the questions from the YouTube. Now let's move to we have about maybe ten minutes to to move to um, this uh, for them the three D reconstruction in the. Uh, in, in the future, right? So in particular, for example, like when comparing uh, how people like taking photos, right? Like reconstructing 3D models um, is still costly. I think uh, uh, when this uh, talk made a fundamental leap in terms of like uh, how we can do this very efficiently, 10 times faster is a, a non-market achievement. But in general, so how we going to uh, what are the really the maybe even the fundamental uh, challenges here to, for example, to reconstruct 3D models as easy as uh, we, uh, taking photos, right, the images. So maybe we can have some thoughts on uh, some some comments on this. Maybe we start. Or maybe. Uh, Sivon, do you have comments on this? 
Um, uh, you, you mean about the, 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 the future or the potential for this uh, 3D reconstruction, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, okay, Facebook changed the name of its uh, company. So Metaverse, Metaverse is coming. So Metaverse, one important, uh, you know, basic or fundament, uh, fundamental uh, technique for the Metaverse is about 3D. So users should be able to uh, create 3D models efficiently and with um, you know good quality or but actually I think you know uh, it's uh, it's definitely a, a, a trend and uh, you see right now the demand for 3D models reconstructions is uh, stronger getting stronger right especially from images right mm -hmm. we take a photo and uh, maybe through views for example to uh, reconstruct the human body or human movements. Three photos, we can get a 3D uh, you know, uh, human body. Uh, although the quality is not as high as we, uh, we imagine, but it's getting higher and higher. I think it's, we are on the, on the path to, to, you know, uh, to, to get that point. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, my, my limit is probably this for the vision of the future as Xu uh, Xing and Xu uh, Feng said, VR, AR consumption. I think the need for reconstruction uh, based on their smartphone should be uh, video based, should be easy to use, that is fast. Instead of taking minutes or hours for our simple object, or we want to input or import into AR environment. It should be reconstruction should be done in seconds. And representation doesn't have to be always 3D geometry. It can be our network encoded. As long as you can view that object correctly, you can manipulate, all right? Because it's not really for 3D printing, it doesn't have to be 3D geometry all the time. Uh, therefore, some light field approach could be used. And finally, uh, 3D reconstruction has different requirements in terms of accuracy for different applications. For SLAM, for other applications, maybe geometric details are not important. You can do it in real time. Uh, as uh, recently uh, the group in Zhejiang University has achieved uh, real-time video. But if for, for, but for some other application, maybe you do want high quality reconstruction because uh, that uh, is reconstruction task. You want to create the object, just not for your own use for this moment. You want to create this for some other virtual rooms like game or movie or animation. Uh, in those scenarios, maybe the high demand or accuracy would justify a longer processing time and uh, so on and so forth. So there are different possibilities. Okay, thanks Wenbi for, for, for the answer, uh, comments. Uh Yin, do you have some thoughts on the, this kind of, uh, like this kind of border perspective, right? So how are we going to, do you want to see this kind of 3D reconstruction, this field like progress, like, so one thing mentioned, right? So uh, representation is important. Sometimes we don't need like this very detailed reconstructions for certain applications, right? So, uh, but on the other hand, for example, like this kind of cell phones, right? You can use cell phones to do, to get 3D information, 3D model, that would be really scale up the, 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 uh, the field. Okay, so Yindu, what is uh, like your thought? So I, I, I... I very much agree with the uh, Dr. Wang's opinion. I, I feel like that uh, the, the 3D reconstruction in many cases is not our ultimate goal. So in many cases, it is followed by some downstream applications, right? So what you want to do with the whatever, you know, those 3D informations and you want to create an image, right? You, you want to do image normal view synthesis or you just want to do identification and uh, or you want to generate an virtual reality or you want to create simulation stuff 
or you want to do the 3D printing. I think different application and uh, will drive different directions of the future of 3D reconstruction. So to towards a higher accuracy, towards a better performance, right? To towards to uh, uh, the faster and uh, reconstruction results, or maybe dedicated for better and uh, detection rates or more or, uh, a high accurate, a more accurate detection rates, you know, for instance, for autonomous driving, this type of stuff. So I, 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 I feel like that this is kind of the future of all the computing. I, I don't like universal computing, the, the concept of universal computing. I think computing should be dedicated and especially profited for different applications. So this is the first thing. And I, I, and another thing is that I really think that the, the true breakthrough is happening at the hardware level, not at the software level. This is my personal opinion, right? And uh, basically, if we look at the, look at the, the, the what, what computer science has been developing, you know, we are using, at least for myself, <laughs> I'm, I'm simulation people, right? I'm, I'm using the algorithm in hundreds of years old, and I'm very happy with those algorithms. <laughs> but what, re what really makes a difference is this hardware. We have GPU, we have, we have faster, uh, CPU, we have GPU, we have maybe in the future a quantum computer, right? So those those hardware makes all the different computing problems and uh, full, full of uh, different possibilities. So I'm, I'm so excited and see the future, you know, at the intersection between the application, the hardware, and uh, um, the, the customized algorithm. Okay, thanks, thanks, Ying, and thanks, uh, Wenping, again, for the wonderful talk, for the interest time. Uh, so let's close the so this week's of uh, uh, 3DG seminar, thanks to for attending and uh, the wonderful discussion. Thanks all, okay. <laughs>